Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to another session on understanding Chablis and Chardonnay for the WSET Level 3. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jimmy, I'm the founder and owner of West London Wine School, South London Wine School and a wine bar called Streatham Winehouse uh, in London in the United Kingdom. Um, this is part of our Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel where we help you with uh, preparing for WSET exams. This is very useful, this one for the WSET level three. For In this we'll go through Chablis, we'll go through the grape Chardonnay and how that can be manufactured into different styles. But then we'll also look at maps, a Google Earth video of the Chablis area. And we'll then finish on a working written question as well. So you're able to prepare yourself for the, the examination for the WSET level three. So here we go. Uh, here is um, a picture of Chablis. This is standing on the viewpoint just above one of the climats uh, or one of the Ludis, which is Le Clos. Blanchot is just off to the left hand side. And to the right of that picture, you'll be able to see the town of Chablis. Uh, so uh, it's quite a auspicious day there with some quite menacing, threatening clouds. But it's a very good viewpoint looking southwest on this very majestic and well-known Grand Cru of Chablis. Okay, so Chablis in France is that northern tip of uh, Burgundy. It is the Yonne department, named after the river Yonne. And uh, yeah, it's very close to Champagne. It's actually sandwiched, as we can see here, sandwiched between Champagne, this kind of yellowish uh, area in the top, uh, excuse me, I just need to get the arrow out just here. So there's Champagne, so sandwiched there, but also between uh, the western parts of, uh, sorry, the eastern parts of the Loire. So this is Sancerre. It's actually quite close to Puy and Puy Fume. Um, so it's uh, that area that's nestled in between that. As mentioned in the Yon department, uh, and there are many areas around Chablis. It's not the only place here. Um, there is the Grand Auxerrois. There is the Châtillonnet amongst many others as well. But Chablis is the only one that you are required to know for your WSCT level three. Um, so Chablis is the name of a town. It is therefore the name of the wine that is produced from that town. Uh, this is quite north. The latitude here is very north and it is mainly continental here. Due to the latitude being very north, it is a cool continental climate. Uh, that, therefore, the average temperatures during the growth season are below 16.5 degrees. Oops, I put degs there because I can't fit it on. Uh, but below 16.5 degrees on average. Continental because it is landlocked. Uh, so you will therefore find that this is not as influenced by the um, effect of the, uh, of the Atlantic. Um, so just to give you an idea of that, and we always talk through this, there is the great westerly wind that uh, d does affect the um, many parts of, uh, of Western France, and of course will affect many parts of Northern France as well. And that westerly wind bringing some moisture, bringing some warmth as well, is what comes across the Atlantic this way. Of course, it will affect many areas in the Southwest um, places like Bordeaux, of course, uh, the Loire, but a lot of this heads up to the Paris Basin, so it heads up this way, okay? Uh, so we tend to go this way. Um, if it gets towards this way, it tends to get pushed up as well because there is the massive Centrale. So you will get some weather patterns affecting Burgundy. Um, so rainfall is possible. Rainfall can happen um, throughout the year as well. And as you will need to know, in areas where rainfall is possible, uh, rainfall is an issue with producing things such as mildew, uh, but also things like rot later on in the season. Uh, so uh, it is important to site your vineyards well with good aeration, uh, often on slopes. This is very, very important indeed, um, with good canopy management, allowing good air circulation. So the uh, things like mildew and rot don't take hold as much. Other ways around that, of course, uh, is spraying, and you will find this happening. So this is spraying with sulfur, so dusting with sulfur, and also copper, sulfate, and lime. The Bordeaux mixture will be used to protect against the mildews. Um, spring frosts are also um, fairly uh, um, dominating here. In fact, this is the big issue, really, of Chablis. The issue really is that Chardonnay is early budding, 
And if it's early budding, this means, of course, it has to run the gauntlet of a longer spring. And that means, of course, spring frosts can definitely affect the Chardonnay. In 2017, for instance, a huge amount of Chablis crop was lost. And of course, this will be detrimental for the prices for us. Of course, prices will tend to go up and remain quite pricey due to the um, lack of availability of Chablis. Um, spring frosts, of course, occur at that early part of the year, damaging or destroying buds and stopping their growth, the embryonic growth of the bud. This will therefore mean that the vine may be able to sort of rebound against, rebound against this and grow more buds and more shoots, but of course it will still reduce the overall yield. And there are ways of combating against those spring frosts. Um, the, we have talked through many of these in the past, but there's, it doesn't hurt to go through these again. So let's pop this one here. So first of all, actually I'll do, I'll do a, a number of arrows here. There we go. Um, first of all, an important way of combating it would be through planning. Uh, so what we mean by this is if you are siting a vineyard, grow, uh, planting a vineyard, um, it's important to site it on slopes, um, on hillsides, because this will reduce the possibility of frost. Frost tends to settle more uh, at the base of a slope and then towards a flatter land, the valley area. Uh, so that is uh, planning, that's one area. But if you have vineyards, of course, you'll have to uh, combat frost in situ. Uh, and that is uh, around uh, sprinkling. Uh, so, oops, sprinkling, there we go. Um, that is also around um, heaters uh, and then wind machines. Okay. There are many other little ways as well to, to, to help it, uh, but uh, sprinkling is where um, if an area is kind of riddled with frost on uh, an annual basis, then they will have quite extensive reservoirs nearby which, uh, and pumping stations which will allow for sprinkling. Uh, and this process is where water is sprinkled onto the vine just before a frost is on set. Um, and what will happen is that water, which then forms around the bud, will then change state as it freezes. As it changes state from a liquid to a solid, this is called aspersion, and it will actually release latent heat into the bud, keeping the bud warm and encapsulating it and protecting it against the frost. So therefore, it's quite a useful method. Heaters are things like wood heaters, which are not environmentally friendly, or things like um, bougies, which are like candle wax, which is born um, burnt within the vineyard. Expensive, hard to maintain, People are working unsociable hours in the middle of the morning doing this, so more expensive, um, but they do create a greenhouse effect which stops the frost from settling. And then wind machines allows for good air circulation, good convection, and this stops the frost from settling, but they tend to be very pricey initially and there can be problems with them um, in uh, you know, maintaining them and so on. So spring frosts. Um, hail also is uh, a bit of an issue too in, in this area. Uh, hail will tend to um, be localized, be very damaging. Uh, a way ar around hail is to strategically think about where you source your grapes from. This is not always possible, of course, because you may have just your own vines around your estate, your domain. Um, but if you are able to source like a negociant and pick grapes for a number of farmers, it's better to spread them out as much as possible. So hail is very localized and that will damage a certain area. So if you spread your vineyards, then you'll have less of an effect. Um, but they do damage um, uh, um, damage vines, they shred leaves, um, they can destroy vines if it's heavy enough. And if it's later on, a late summer hail, then that will actually destroy the green grapes and split them leading to rot. Um, there are many other ways around uh, protecting from hail. There is netting, uh, which you may find. Um, there is a cannon that fires um, this silver oxide stuff into the air, um, which is not great for the environment again, but it, it uh, stops the hail from forming and, and it falls as rain, uh, amongst many others. But there's early warning systems in place for these kind of things, uh, metallurgical reports and so on. Okay, so that's Chablis in France talking about its climate and its weather conditions. Chablis, um, then this is a, a more close-up of the area. To get your whereabouts, first of all, let's identify some key, um, key places. Here is the city of Auxerre, which is the largest city in the area. 
Um, the River Yon that I mentioned is what runs on the, um, uh, let's just draw this on here for you. So this runs on your um, western side of this. So that's just down here. Here's the Yon. Okay. Eventually, the Serine, which is our river here, the Serine starts its life off down towards the Ardèche and then runs up through here. And it's the river which really is the main river of Chablis. It goes through Chablis or just north of it uh, and then comes up here and eventually will meet the Yon and empties into the Yon. Serine meaning uh, serene, uh, probably because it's quite a gentle river. Um, so, yeah, so, so Chablis is based there. Um, so it's close to Auxerre. There are many vineyards around it. I mentioned those as well um, down in the bottom left of that picture. Saint Brie is famous for Sauvignon Blanc. But you are just required to know about Chablis. Um, the area is, is really formed on limestone. Uh, different types of limestone, which uh, specifically here are called Kimmeridian Marls. Um, but uh, I'll scribble this up at the top for you. Uh, so we have uh, limestone is the key uh, keystone. Now, this was covered at one point under a warm tropical ocean many millions of years ago, 140, 50 million years ago. And all of the deposits from the marine life, the, um, the sea urchins, the oysters and so on, all of that, they would die and fall to the bottom and their bones, which is full of calcium, formed the soil. And this is your limestone. Uh, the specific epoch is Kimmeridian. Kimmeridian. Uh, and they are uh, famous here for Kimmeridian Marls. Kimmeridian Marls um, are uh, basic, Marl is like a more clayey limestone. There's also Portlandian limestone in this uh, in this area as well, which is another epoch, which is a bit younger. Okay, so um, it's a really um, high calcium soil, very alkaline, which produces exceedingly acidic grapes. And Chablis is very well known for producing these acidic styles. Um, what else do we have here? So the town of Chablis is identified uh, just there in that middle area. Um, so here we go. So there is the town of Chablis. Okay. Um, in red, I'm going to show you that that's the Grand Cru area just there. That's the famous Grand Cru slope. It's only one Grand Cru, um, but there are several different names for it. So I'll put Grand Cru up here for you. That is the famous Grand Cru. But we'll have a, a bit of a closer look at this in a second. The slightly darker orange, um, which is identified um, dotted around. So there's a nice slope just here. There's also a, some down near Phi. There's some um, the other side of Chablis. This is our premier crew locations, okay, which are the next best thing. Let's pop that down for you, premier crew. And then the yellow um, sort of areas, uh, which are then dotted around as well. These are your Chablis and Petit Chablis areas. Okay, it's a much larger area, Chablis and also Petit Chablis. Um, they're generally on flatter landscape. They generally uh, on, are on Portlandian limestone, making nice fruity styles, but still with that minerally Chablis, but often not that complex, whereas the Premier and Grand Cru, of course, do become much more complex in their style generally. Um, so the Shabli hierarchy then, just to reiterate that, the ones in bold are the ones that are um, um, highlighted in the Level 3 textbook, and that is Grand Cru, Premier Cru, and Shabli. Petit Shabli is the expansive area which was created in the 1980s, but um, it looks like they're not going to ask you things around that. Um, so at the top of the tree is, of course, the Grand Cru. Um, so Grand Cru is... Um, a very small production, as you can see here. Um, it actually accounts for about 100 hectares out of the 5,000. So it's about 2% of Chablis' total production. There is only one Grand Cru, but it has seven different names, and we'll look at that in the next slide. Um, then there are the Premier Crus, and the Premier Crus are um, dotted around on the next best sites. Uh, there are a number of these um, into the hundreds, uh, but these are you know, very good examples of Chablis as well. And then there's generic Chablis, as I mentioned, on the slightly flatter area. And then finally, at the bottom, Petit Chablis. Um, so uh, the difference really between these three at the top that you need to know is that Grand Cru will have the optimum sites, and that is on the best slopes, and certainly here fa facing southwest. 
Um, Premier Cruise will be on some south, uh, southeast and some southwest facing slopes. Um, and then Chablis will generally be on some slopes, but normally flatter landscape, making slightly simpler wines, for instance. You then have this area. So this is uh, the town of Chablis at the bottom left here. And here is that clump of uh, 100 hectares of Grand Cru Chablis. Uh, there is only one Grand Cru. This whole yellow area is one big Grand Cru, but there are seven plotted names that you can find your grapes in. So this is Bourgros, Preuse, Val d'Azir, Grenouille, Valmeur, Luclo, and Blanchot. Um, so these are all climats. Uh, so let's scribble that down for you so you are sure what that means. Uh, so let's pop that there. So these are climats. Climats basically are unnamed sites, named vineyards. Um, so it is quite confusing for people because they see Grand Cru Chablis and then lots of these different names and they think there are more than one, but this is just one Grand Cru. Um, where I've written Climat, that's the forest at the top. You can see it in the picture here. The picture is Val d'Azir and Valmour, which is this nice amphitheater area on steep slopes. Val d'Azir faces southwest. This whole kind of area generally faces that kind of southwest direction this way. Important here because it's so cold uh, to get the optimum ripeness. So you get really um, good ripening levels here. And in fact, the Chardonnay grown on Grand Cru can get ripe concentration, still has the minerality behind it, the salty, briny character due to the soils. And you can see in this picture, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, soils here because this is uh, before the vines started flourishing. This is uh, early winter, late winter, sorry. There is lovely chalky, chalky soils here. And this is that um, Kimmeridium mild soil, which is classic in the area. So you, you actually find with Grand Cru Chablis that the wine is quite powerful. It's actually a little bit reminiscent of Chardonnay from around the Cote de Beaune. Uh, and that is actually quite important. They do actually um, mature these wines often in oak, uh, which is unusual for Chablis, but Grand Cru can be in oak with malolactic fermentation and lees aging. So you will find Grand Cru Chablis being close in style to a Cote de Bone Chardonnay, maybe a Bone, uh, maybe a, a Montrachet or something like that, um, but with a bit more of a leanness and a bit more of a minerality, stony, sort of briny character throughout the wine. So I wanted to show you a, uh, a video um, just so you can get a good feel. And this is a Google Earth 3D video, a really good feel for the Grand Cru area, um, but some other local attractions as well. So it's a two minute video only, but uh, it gives you an idea in 3D. So we'll look at Chablis generically, the Grand Cru site, and then locally nearby towards the Mozan Forest is uh, an abbey called the Abbey Verzelet which in fact there is a wine region around, a small wine region, very, very tiny, um, a new one, but uh, it's a very important abbey uh, in the history of the area. So here we are focusing on Chablis, the town, um, and we have identified in the background there all of the seven climats for your Grand Cru Chablis. We're just gonna focus on a couple of the famous ones here. So these two have been left highlighted, that's Le Clos, which tends to make the broadest masculine sort of mineral style that needs often quite a lot of time to develop um, but it is a very famous it's the largest of the climats of the Grand Cru. Um, just at the bottom here was Blanchot and uh, we mentioned before in the distance it's Grenouille um, but in the background there Val d'Azir which is probably the most revered of the climats but all of this is a south uh, generally southwest facing slope some of them are a little bit more south than others some of them are a little bit more southeast um, but southwest um, on that Kimmeridium Mile, which is limestone, producing nice, powerful Chardonnays, which will go in oak, which will go through lees and malolactic, creating complex, textured, briny, salty wines, which um, are quite classic of the of the Chablis Grand Cru. Everywhere around it will be a mixture of Premier Cru's and um, generic Chablis and Petit Chablis. Just to finish on a nice little bit of history, the gorgeous Abbey of Vezelay, which uh, is in the, just on the cusp of the forest as you head down towards Bone, and there it is, uh, famous and still standing after the um, perils of the French Revolution, but uh, wonderfully proud sitting on its hill. Um, and uh, yeah, good, good spate of history behind that beautiful, uh, beautiful Abbey. Great, so that is your uh, 
your Chablis area. Let's go back to our presentation and let's move on to the grape growing of this area, which I've already mentioned a fair bit about. The best vineyards then, just to reiterate this so you are sure, will be found on the Grand Cru and then the Premier Cru areas. And these will generally be on nice steep slopes with good south facing aspects, maybe southeast, southwest, but generally south facing aspects. That is to gain more warmth and that is to gain more ripening of the Chardonnay grapes. The basic village level, that's AOC Chablis, is planted on generally the flatter area. Some of it will be on some hills, but can be north facing or somewhere like east facing. Uh, and that tends to make that really chalky, minerally lean style of Chablis. Um, the battle against frost and hail we discussed already at the early part of this presentation and the ways to combat that. So um, it's quite a, a useful thing uh, to go back if you didn't catch that at the start of this presentation. Um, Chardonnay in um, Burgundy, this is, accounts for about half of the vineyard area. So what I do need to do here is make you uh, fully aware that it is only the grape of Chablis. So I need to scribble that down because this was actually taken from a Burgundy uh, presentation that I did. A hundred percent of Chablis is Chardonnay. Okay. Um, so, uh, but it's about half the vineyard area of Burgundy. So therefore the principal grape variety of the region, but we are talking about Chablis, the town, of course. Um, it's home in Burgundy. It was first mentioned in the 17th century. There is a village called Chardonnay, which is found down in the Maconnais. Um, Chardonnay is a remarkably adaptable uh, grape variety. It's found in all climates and hence why it is grown everywhere in the world and the most cultivated white grape variety today. Um, so we will find it in cool conditions like this in Chablis, where it produces more leaner and minerally laden style wines. But you'll also find it in um, moderate climates down towards sort of central and southern France, uh, but also new world areas like um, uh, like uh, Australia, like uh, New Zealand, which is a bit cooler. But uh, Argentina everywhere grows a bit of Chardonnay. Um, it's early budding, and I've mentioned that already, and I'll underline that once again. Uh, that is the issue with frost. Okay, early budding varieties um, will have to run the gauntlet of a longer spring, which will mean that you may get frost damage uh, because this is a longer time um, it, it, through that early part of spring. It's actually quite early ripening, so that's why it does quite well at this high latitude, and it's fairly productive, hence why many people choose to work with it. Um, it's best on limestone, we went through that. Um, limestone is alkaline, so it has a, a very high pH, and in com um, comparison, the vines have to work very hard for balance, so they produce quite high acidities to balance that. Uh, so as a result, you often get pHs of around two and a half to three, which is very acidic, hence why the acidities of Chardonnays, uh, certainly in Chardonnay, are very, very, uh, in Chablis, are very high. Um, Chardonnay is very clonally di diverse. A lot of diversity stems from what we call the Dijon clones of Burgundy. I won't go too much detail about that because it's not mentioned too much in your books, but there are many different types of Chardonnay. There are Mendoza clones and you name it, there are lots of them. Um, in the winemaking side of it, WSET like you to understand that Chardonnay is not an aromatic. It's a non-aromatic grape variety. So a lot of its flavor will come from the site and then what we do to it, what the winemaker will do to it. Um, you can do some whole bunch pressing. So this is seen, so if the grapes come in and they're hand harvested with stems intact and then are pressed on those stems uh, and the juice is taken away, this is seen as a way to protect the grapes, um, to keep it sturdy, keep it structured, and then uh, to stop oxidation, uh, which could lead, um, there could be some oxidation from the grape if it is pulled off the stems on the vine. So whole bunch pressing is a very common process which occurs specifically in France, is very famous, um, to protect against oxidation. So it is a, an important process for keeping fresher juice. Um, malolactic fermentation and malolactic conversion. So where whole bunch pressing will happen in Chablis, 
malolactic fermentation will happen uh, and it does happen now it's it's said in textbooks that it doesn't tend to happen so much in chablis and that's why you get all these green fresh characters you're going to get these green fresh characters in chablis no matter what um, it is inherent of its location, its cool climate. But um, they do want to create a slightly more rounded style often, so they will encourage malolactic fermentation. The addition or introduction of lactic bacteria to feed on the small percentage of malic acid found naturally in the grape, converting it to lactic acid. And this creates a creamier character, a bit of body, a bit of texture. Um, so this will happen across most Chardonnay places, um, and it does happen a lot in Chablis more than you think. Um, Lee's aging as well. Now, this is something which is uncommon in Chablis. Uh, you don't tend to find it too much, apart from some Premier Crus and a lot of the Grand Cru. Um, the, it is seen that the Lee's, which will release flavor and aroma, manoproteins, that's texture, um, will tend to overpower the delicacy of the non-aromatic Chardonnay from Chablis. Uh, so you'll tend to find that that is not common, but but it is one that's very debatable with Chardonnay because if you go down to the Côte d'Or, specifically the Côte de Bone, a lot of lees contact and fine lees gives a texture and flavor and aromatic profile to Chardonnay. And, and of course, this may happen uh, as, as well as a bit of maturation, um, in oak. So fermentation can occur in oak, maturation can as well. Um, it, it, often people will simplify it saying Chablis has no oak and then the rest of Burgundy does. Um, it's not as easy as that. Chablis does tend to steer away from oak and that's certainly for generic Chablis. Uh, but old oak will be used as a vessel more than anything. Um, but um, new oak is used by some producers. Some producers believe in new oak to impart um, more power and more texture. Um, so uh, it can happen, but it tends to be uncommon. Oak does tend to only be found for you guys for level three on the Grand Cru Chablis uh, in comparison to the rest of Burgundy, which is quite classic with oak fermentations and maturations. And oxidation. Now, there have been um, issues in the past where these great fine Burgundies, including Grand Cru Chablis, have not aged as well as they could. Uh, and that is because they have not protected the juice or the wine enough from oxidation in the production side of it. Um, and this is something which we call premature oxidation or premox. So this is something which they've worked very hard on in the last 15 to 20 years to eliminate oxidative notes through the winemaking uh, to help more long lived Chardonnays. Um, I do find that the exceptionally high acidities behind Chablis, top end Chablis, Grand Cru Chablis, means that it ages really well anyway. It really kind of stays on a straight and narrow linear acidic path uh, and develops over long periods of time. Uh, and really to help keep it fresh, sulfur dioxide will be used as well as an antioxidant and as an antiseptic. It is used commonly to protect musts, as you know. So sulfur dioxide will be used in the protection of Chablis as well as most Chardonnay. Chardonnay um, will here produce a dry, high acidic mineral style wine. Mineral for you on your tasting cards or anything like wet stones, uh, things like flint. But, you know, you could have brine or salty characteristics as well. Many people mention, a lot of students say, well, how do you get salty briny notes when we're nowhere near the ocean? Remember, the soils are formed over millions of years from marine life, from the ocean. So that is what can create that distinct briny mineral note which comes through the acidity and flavor profile there you know is varied but uh, please look at that of course in your own time so um, a bit of a partial written question here so we can help you understand what may be asked um, of you when you come to your level three examination here is a domaine la roche uh, chablis grand cru la blanche um, La Roche being one of the um, slightly more um, prominent producers. State and describe the climate of this wine. So, uh, cool continental, as you know, temperatures below an average of 16.5 degrees Celsius during the growth season with hot summers and cold winters. You could add, because you know about Chablis, you could add that rainfall can be an issue, um, but these are weather patterns. It's generally asking about the, the climate of the, of the area. What factors in the vineyard will equate to this being a complex wine? So we're looking at complex and premium more than anything for four marks. Found on the most desired steep slopes facing south or southwest 
on various limestone soils uh, well suited to the production of premium Grand Cru Chablis. That will get you the four marks easily, peasily. Okay, we've mentioned that many times, but uh, yes, it's about the steep south southwest facing slopes on the beautiful limestone. This wine is often medium to full body, that's because it's a Grand Cru Chablis, complex with primary, secondary, and tertiary flavors. State and explain three methods a winemaker can use to obtain this style. Um, so this is to add more body, to add more complexity, and to add more secondary tertiary characteristics. First of all, mallow lactic fermentation. Went through this, we'll do it again. A secondary fermentation through an inoculation with lactic bacteria, normally introduced but can be natural, that converts the natural malic acid, about 20% of a grape's acidity, into lactic acid. This creates secondary flavors, uh, and on your tasting card you'll find this like dairy, cream, milk, butter, and imparts a bit of body into the wine as well. It often can take the edge of the very acidic nature of Chablis uh, too. Method two, yeast autolysis. That is the action of the yeast on the wine. Keeping the wine in contact with the fine lees for an extended time, often up to a year, in any vessel, but often oak, maximizing contact through processes such as stirring the lees or what's called batonnage. This creates secondary flavors um, uh, like bread, cream, and dough, but also please add here texture, body. That's what will add that kind of body, making it more medium or full body. Very important to add that in at the bottom. Method three, uh, so this is to get your final three marks, oak fermentation and or maturation. Uh, the use of oak, be it new or old, uh, in barrique or barrel, will enable secondary flavors such as oak, cedar, vanilla, and oxidative, because it will be controlled oxidation coming through the barrel, such as kernel, that's nuttiness, almond, walnut may, um, may develop because of that. So here you have actually answered with those three methods, why it's medium to full body, that's malolactic and yeast autolysis, complex with primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, the secondary and tertiary have been identified due through these processes as well. You can mention primary here, um, just the fact that it is, uh, of course, from those steep slopes, but we've already covered that. So that is it. Um, once again, uh, the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel, which you have found this video on, has many other very useful videos which will gear you up for your level three examination. Um, please uh, leave any comments um, in the bottom. We're very keen on that. Uh, ask any questions as you wish, um, and get in touch with us on our social media channels, which were at the bottom of every slide of this presentation. That is at Wine with Jimmy, that's me, at West London Wine, which is my wine school in Fulham, London, United Kingdom, South London Wine, which is in um, Streatham and Greenwich, London, United Kingdom, and my wine bar in Streatham Hill, which is Streatham Wine House. Um, so please get in touch with any of those. Uh, if you're in London, please come and see us for a class for a glass or for a bottle. It'll be brilliant to see you. Um, thank you again for visiting the Wine with Jimmy channel. Bye-bye.